This account is entirely factual, as impossible and dramatized as it may seem. I had taken 2CB before in several different doses and was not influenced by sickness, nutritional or emotional imbalances, or any other chemical during this trip. I have previously had great trips on 2CB. Do I think it's likely this could happen to you, the average reader? No, but it did happen to me. Therefore, I feel that readers should know of 2CB's potential effects on the body and carefully determine if the risk is worth it in their own opinion. Basic Info I have extensive knowledge of several chemicals including LSD, magic mushrooms, ecstasy, cannabis, cocaine, crack cocaine, DXM, alcohol, tobacco, and numerous prescriptions. I am 18 and in good health and decent shape and have never encountered out of the norm physical side effects on any psychedelic prior to this. Dosage: 3 gel caps containing 10 mg of 2CB each. Source: The person my boyfriend acquired a bulk 2CB purchase from told him that while it wasn't mescaline, he should tell others that's what it was. He didn't research the drug before experimenting and only in hindsight did we find that it's actually closer to MDMA than mescaline. This was real 2CB. Setting: Jack's neighborhood pool, backyard, and bedroom. All familiar and comfortable locations. Time. I didn't record specific times but know that we ingested our respective 30 milligrams close to 10 p.m. The experience. Jack and I had been tripping on 2CB weekly for the past month. We began with 20 mg, 10 mg via insufflation and 10 mg swallowed. The peak was intense. The only words we could describe it with were, it feels like your face is melting, melting down the drain. Having snorted several things that burn, I feel knowledgeable enough to not recommend this method. The agony is intense and the drip is foul. The only time I ever vomited on 2CB was after insufflation. Jack decided after one time that he'd rather swallow and wait for the peak. I tend to try something until I have a reason not to, methods included, and didn't discontinue insufflation until I both vomited and fainted. Not fun. We waited until it was dark and swallowed our doses, then gathered our swimsuits, a flashlight, towels, and the key to his pool. We knew not to drive and the walk took an estimated 10 minutes. The water was cool but pleasant. We stayed for 1.5 to 2 hours. On the return walk, I recognized that I was tripping. I couldn't feel the mosquitoes that I knew were swarming and biting us. Couldn't feel much in general. The sidewalk edges seemed to blur and shift. My walk was unsteady, weaving would be accurate, and the night sky was intense. There was a full moon and the contrast between the inky sky and the glittering fragments of stars with that giant glowing orb was fascinating. Both Jack and I perceived ourselves to be sober, but experience taught us that we weren't. After arriving at his house, we sat on his deck and talked for a while. We had cigarettes and we both lit one. Whenever I trip, 2CB especially, I never actually seem to smoke the cigarette. It's there, lit, and I think I'm smoking it when I remember I have it. Other times I forget I have a lit cigarette and don't realize until I look down and see the cigarette of mostly ash. We went into his bedroom and he decided to put on Monty Python and the Meaning of Life. I prefer keeping my eyes closed while on 2CB because the visuals are our favorite part. Colors in this geometric, almost grid that ebb and pulsate. Rooms always look strange, not right somehow, ugly even with my eyes open. Jack said the movie was awesome for tripping and I decided to watch it. Mistake. I always felt nauseous near peak and after I did vomit, I feared it. The movie opens with a very nautical themed scene and I kept telling Jack I felt queasy. He thought I meant the peak and said, don't worry, it'll pass, it always does. Finally, I told him that the movie itself was making me queasy and he promptly turned it off. There seemed to be this whirlpool in the middle of the TV screen that took the images and whoosh, swirled them into this mess of stark colors and sound and I could hardly understand the movie. He replaced it with the wall and things went well until the tremors hit. Each time I began to peek, I would get tremors. Initially, they would stop when I stopped peeking, but with each new 2CB trip, the tremors would get more pronounced and last longer. Several people report the tremors, but when it happens to me, it gets scary. 
I told myself I shook as the peak hit me in waves, but the last time I hit my peak, the tremors stopped and Jack told me he even heard me go. Okay, we're good now. This is nice. We're here now. We're done. I remember it was like I had all this turmoil and anxiety that just built up to a climactic... <sighs> release. It was amazing for a few minutes. Then, I started violently shaking again. I began to get very scared because I had a gut instinct that something wasn't right. I knew I had peaked mentally, but my body was still trying to catch up. My mental and physical systems weren't in sync. It had happened before, and when I stopped focusing on the tremors, they'd go away. This time it hurt, and the pain was feeding the fear. I couldn't break through that into the wonderful mental trip. My body seemed to be attempting to fight it, attack it almost. At this point, Jack, who had tripped on 2CB countless times, began to worry. We were both attempting to pretend we weren't worried, but we weren't very convincing. I started to get cold, just so frigid. I curled under Jack's feather blanket to warm up. I finally got warm, but the tremors got worse. I began to have difficulty breathing. Jack said I was practically panting. It felt like I was breathing fire, then like I was breathing nothing at all. I knew I was, but I couldn't figure out why I was so short of breath and still so cold on the inside. Jack thought it was a bad trip and kept saying, it'll be okay, it's okay. I asked him what was happening to me and he didn't know. It was very difficult to express my thoughts and I became torn. Mentally, I was fine, but I knew something was very wrong with my body. I couldn't understand what, but I knew it wasn't a bad trip because when the tremors would rest for a minute, I could close my eyes and things were warm and happy and fantastic. I wanted to break and go inside, just to have an inside trip without my body because I felt like it was holding me back and hurting me. Jack pulled the blanket off me when his laptop shut down. He said, My computer is hot and it shut off to cool down. Your body is a computer, but what's the fan? I remember looking at him and just saying, I'm scared, Jack. This isn't fun. It hurts and I want it to stop. It's not a bad trip. Something's wrong. I started crying and I was still shaking, still so cold on the inside and still panting. Jack said he was hot and realized I wasn't sweating. He reached over to feel me and left the room. He came back with a thermometer. We argued. I felt cold, but he thought I was hot. The thermometer read that I had a temperature of 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. He went into the kitchen and grabbed ice packs. I couldn't feel them when he threw them on me. The ice felt like his hand. Jack thought about a bath, but I was having trouble breathing. The ice packs melted rapidly and he got new ones. It didn't help much and I don't remember a lot past this point. Jack said I told him that I felt like something in me wasn't working when it should be and that I kept looping saying, I feel like I'm cooking on the inside. He began to search the web for an idea of what was wrong and some of the things he asked me were right. He began to read off symptoms on a list and they all fit. Then he asked me if I wanted to go to the hospital. I will admit that my only response to that question is always an emphatic no. I overdosed a few years ago and was sent to the ER, then to rehab. I did some liver damage and even now have trouble drinking alcohol. He knew that it was obvious I had taken something and that I'd go to rehab again. Worse, he refused to leave me, so he'd get sent back to rehab too. The tremors had leveled in intensity but were still awful and I began to feel something spasming inside my abdominal area. I kept saying, it's my stomach. No, it's not. It's behind. What's behind? It's my stomach. Jack gave me an ultimatum. If your temperature doesn't drop in the next 30 minutes or anything else happens, I'm calling an ambulance. My temperature did drop, hovering at about 98 degrees Fahrenheit, which is still a slight fever for me. He gave me water and I just chugged it, two or three bottles. I was drinking so much water and I wasn't sweating or urinating. Jack wondered where it went and searched the internet a little more. He looked at me and asked about my liver. I didn't understand and told him the truth, that it's a little damaged and doesn't quite work at full capacity. Later, when we were nearing baseline, I realized how stupid I'd been. At first, he thought it was a heat stroke, but when I started having pain, he thought it was something wrong with my kidneys. Once I was cool to the touch, he turned me over and felt my lower back. The area right where my kidney is was very hot still. 
We finally took some melatonin and went to sleep once we reached baseline. The afterword. My entire body was sore for three days. I was severely dehydrated. Not that you'll want to know this, but I got my period a week early. This happened every time I took 2CB. I'd get my period despite being very regular and on the pill. I have since learned the pill can increase sensitivity to MDMA and 2CB. The factors. Swimming dries skin out, making it more difficult to sweat. This could have contributed to the very high temperature. The pill can increase sensitivity and I took a fairly large dose, even not knowing this it was too large for my body. My liver was slightly, very slightly damaged and when something goes awry with my body, it has a harder time purifying my blood, plasma, and fat, just waste in general. My kidneys have a greater strain placed on them to pick up the slack. Conclusion This was beyond strange. I should have listened to my body when I first started getting a strange vibe about 2CB. From the second trip, something has always gone physically wrong. This is a drug that I should only take in low doses, if at all. There isn't enough research on the long-term or build-up effects of 2CB on the body, and it seemed to have a degenerative effect with repeated high doses and frequent trips. Jack also feels this drug is risky. He had no ill effects past nausea in the beginning, and when he had his last trip, same dosage as the first, he experienced muscle soreness that lasted a few days, dehydration, and insomnia. Neither of us will ever touch 2CB again. My doctor told me it was a heat stroke and extreme kidney stress. There are a lot of positives about 2CB, and I did enjoy it greatly for a while, but this was hell. In my late teens and early 20s, I was heavily into heroin and various other hard drugs. I got arrested in 2009 for possession of narcotics, and I was sentenced to a mandatory rehab and probation since it was my first offense. When I left the rehab, I was forced to take urine screens twice a week as part of the conditions of my probation. I had no desire to change my ways, but since I had never been to jail, the idea scared me. I met up with this girl who I used to get high with and she told me she knew of a smoke shop in the south part of my city that sold all sorts of legal highs. These were basically drugs sold in stores that contained chemicals that had similar highs to things like weed, coke, and even Xanax. The best part of this was that, according to her, they didn't show up on drug tests. I was sold. Hook, line, and sinker. I had been working and living with my parents again after rehab, so I had a couple hundred bucks in my wallet and no bills to pay. So we piled in our car and drove to the smoke shop. When I walked inside, there was the usual display cases of assorted pieces and the strong smell of incense tingled my nostrils. I walked deeper into the store and there was a woman standing behind a glass counter, like one you would see in a deli, with dozens of various multicolored bags on display. I couldn't believe it. I literally could buy legal drugs that would get me high from a store. The girl I was with had all been here before and we began talking to the lady discussing what all the various things she had were like. After a brief conversation, the woman showed me this bag labeled Ivory Wave. This is when I first learned about bath salts. Now here is a disclaimer for you all. Bath salts did not make a zombie. This all happened before any of this was seen in the media. It was not a well-known drug at the time, but let me just say, I did not eat anyone, I did not kill anyone, and most importantly, it did not feel like a crazy concoction of PCP mixed with acid and cocaine. Most of the time, it was MDPV, which is chemically similar to things such as meth and ecstasy, so basically, it was an extremely strong stimulant. I was hooked from the first line I did. It was fucking great. It was a powerful drug and it was fairly cheap, $25 to $50 for a gram, and it was so easy to get. I did it all the time, every single day. Yeah, it had side effects like psychosis, weight loss, and extreme irritability, but it was strong and I loved it. I was back to my usual ways of hustling and stealing for cash, but I was passing my drug tests and no one could do anything about it. After about six months of regular use and experimenting with various brands, 
A friend told me that the smoke shop got a new shipment of bath salts in called V, and it was even better than any of the shit I had bought previously. There was no way I was going to pass up on this opportunity, so he came and picked me up and we drove to the smoke shop and purchased a $50 bag of V. I noticed a difference as soon as I saw the bag. It was an entirely black bag, unlike the usually colorful designs you would see on the other ones. It had no writing on it and just a red letter V printed on the front. I tore open the bag in the parking lot and removed two small plastic vials of white powder from the baggie. I did a huge line off a CD case in the passenger seat of my buddy's car and almost instantly was higher than I had ever been on any bath salt or any type of stimulant in my entire life. This shit was amazing. I had never experienced anything like this. For months after that, the only bath salt I would buy was V. It was great, but the psychosis was unbearable. After using it regularly for a while, I began struggling differentiating between time of day, days of the week, and other basic things. I began to stay up for three to four days at a time, then only sleeping long enough to stay awake for another three to four days. I had hallucinations from time to time, nothing too serious though. Mostly shadowy figures in my peripheral vision, audio hallucinations of people calling out to me or sounds similar to white noise, and various other mild things. Since I had experience with a lot of drugs, it didn't seem too abnormal from doing most stimulants. Although, the hallucinations began to take a turn for the worse. The event I'm about to tell you about was not the only time I had a major freakout, but it was the first I can recall, and there were many others to come after this. I am a hypochondriac, and if I read too much about diseases or anything, I always end up convincing myself that I am sick or dying or have some horrible ailment. Let me just say, it is very hard to convince yourself you are not dying when you've been tweaking out for days at a time. I began to always think I was having a heart attack when I was high, or that some type of parasite was eating away at my body. The only time I didn't feel like I was dying was when I crashed after weeks of binging and would sleep for 16 plus hours, but I still couldn't stop getting high. No matter how bad I felt when I was high, I would still get this gut-wrenching feeling of desire when I would begin to come down. It was all I could think about. All I wanted was another line of V, another vial of V. I would do anything for it. As much as I hated it, I loved it even more. As you might expect, the psychosis did not improve because I did not stop getting high. This led to the first time I ever experienced a horrible freakout that I was physically incapable of talking my way out of. I had been on a binge for a while, maybe a few weeks, only sleeping for three to four hours here and there involuntarily. I had just scored a bunch of V from selling all the stolen silver and I was high as a fucking kite for my third consecutive day of being awake. I was stuck reading online articles about diseases for hours when I made a terrible mistake and I began reading about parasites. I had a small mirror I used to chop lines up on my bedside table and I was furiously scrolling through articles about parasites and becoming more and more paranoid. I picked up the mirror and snorted a fat line. I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the mirror and I swear, I saw a small black worm slide up into my nasal cavity. No fucking way. I totally had to be way too fucking high and paranoid. I couldn't believe it. But being high in stimulants didn't allow me to rationalize what was going on in my head and I had to find out for sure. I held the mirror closer to my nose and looked inside. Sure enough, to my horror, I could see dozens of small caterpillar-like creatures crawling around in my fucking nose. I freaked out. I had to fucking get that shit out of there. I took a paper clip and began to slowly start trying to scrape the worms out of my fucking nose, but to my dismay, every time I used the mirror to look in my nose, all I could see were these fucking worms. They were taunting me, eating me, and seemingly laughing in my futile attempts to destroy them. I had to fucking get them out. I kept trying more and more ways to get them out. Fingers, pens, toothpicks, any type of object I could possibly use as a worm killing tool. But every time I checked, the worms were still there. I began coming up with rational ways that they could have got there. Maybe my drugs came from some jungle area and there was some type of parasitic egg in the powder and they hatched in my skull and all sorts of nonsense like that. At this point, I was losing my shit. 
My emotions were no longer in my control. I screamed, I cried, and I laughed. I was desperately trying to cope with my imminent doom from these parasites. My nose was bleeding profusely, and I knew at that point I only had one option, burn them out. In a fit of laughter, I took a lighter and burned the inside of my nostrils. It hurt like hell, but I didn't notice the pain. I felt relieved. I suddenly became overwhelmed with a sense of pain and pressure in my skull, and the last thing I remember is falling to the ground in a daze. I woke up in a hospital the next day with gauze in my nose and blood all over the front of my hospital gown. My father had apparently heard me fall and found me unconscious and bleeding. I had no recollection of going to the hospital, but I had apparently woken up at some point and was sobbing and desperately trying to convince the doctor to check my nose for worms. They sedated me with some type of benzo and I had slept for about 15 hours. My bath salt use did not end here though. Since my nose was destroyed for the time being, yes I did regain use of my nose later somehow. I began smoking bath salts at this point, much like how you would smoke meth, and I continued using bath salts on a regular basis until 2013, and there were many more horror stories to come. It was the summer of going from grade 9 to high school. By this time, I had been smoking weed steadily for two years, tried various types of opiates and hallucinogens, and I even formed a borderline addiction with both prescription amphetamines and benzodiazepines. I had been taking 6 mg lectopams all day, probably like 7 or 8 by that time, and was lucky enough to score some 50 mg Demerol. I had 4 or 5, but I can't remember, it was 4 years ago. My girlfriend at the time had stolen a ring from another girl and wanted me to sell it for any type of drug. I left the remainder of my pills with my friend Joey and went to my usual weed shop to sell the ring when my dealer informed me of these pills she had. She said her boyfriend took two and felt like he was on acid and her brother took three and was talking to people who weren't there. I was very interested and zealous as I was an intoxicated self-destructive 14 year old. I had no idea what I was getting into. She accepted the stolen ring and gave me an unlabeled bottle of 14 pills she said she obtained from a friend who stole them from her dad who has Parkinson's disease. She warned me not to take more than three. I walked back up to where my friends and girlfriend were after taking three pills. I discovered that Joey had eaten the rest of my Demerol and Lectoprams, so I got mad and swallowed four more pills. My girlfriend took three. She complained that I was greedy, and I was. After this, we all went to Erica's house. My girlfriend left, so I started hitting on Erica, and that's when it hit me. It felt so indescribably weird. It was as if nothing was real, and I began to forget who I and everybody around me was. I remember looking at the ceiling, and it started bubbling and getting mad at me, although it was pleasant. I remember seeing some very real hallucinations and feeling intensely energized and happy. From Erica's, I blacked out until I got home. My brother's friends found me in the woods. I was conscious upon their arrival, but collapsed in mid-discussion. They brought me home. I remember a little about coming home. It was a familiar place, but a new type of magical presence was animating it. At this point, I had forgotten I took the drug, and I went to my room to sit on my couch. I don't have a couch in my room. While I was sitting there, it was actually my stereo, I remember lighting up joint after cigarette after joint after cigarette and having a great old time talking to random strangers at a very social and easygoing party. I don't smoke cigarettes, I didn't have weed, and the only people who came in my room that night were my parents and brother telling me to shut the fuck up and go to bed. It took them a while to figure out that I was too fucked up not to be in a hospital. They drove me down, and apparently the whole way there, I thought we were riding some type of laser train, but I really don't recall anything of the sort. When I got there, I got really violent with the nurses, so they strapped me to the bed, and the first 24 hours after being admitted to intensive care, I can't remember anything at all. The next two days, I remember vividly, accompanied with memories of outrageous things like talking snakes calling me names. The serious delirium began to subside after about four days. 
I can't quite remember the order of trip experiences, or all of them, but I can tell you the ones that I remember most clearly. My family came to stay with me pretty much all through this because the doctors were uncertain if I was going to die or not. I saw my baby sister sit up in her cradle and shoot lasers into the air, and I got into a very heated argument with a cardboard smiley face sun on the wall. At one point, all my family was standing around me asking me who they were, and all I knew was my father's name, but I couldn't remember that he was my father. My dad took me in a private room to videotape me so I could later witness my own behavior. This footage is the most embarrassing thing ever. It showed me in just a hospital gown smoking a joint that didn't exist. I passed it to the camera, dad declined my offer. I then commenced picking imaginary bugs off of the wall and I thought I found an escape door so I ran full throttle into this wall and fell back and my gown lifted up with my genitals exposed. The camera shuts off. The most intense and clear memory I have of this is when I thought my night nurse was someone I fought earlier on that school year but befriended afterwards and I was telling him to undo my straps. I kept asking him and he kept declining and I didn't know why so I got really pissed off and started yelling incessantly. When I started coming down it was the fourth day and I realized where and who I was and I felt like the biggest idiot in the world. I didn't remember anything at first, but as time went on and my family told me stories, some of it came back. I did some research and found out that scopolamine is used in Parkinson's disease treatment, a drug found in common plants most abundant in the seeds of Deuterostromonium and totally legal, and at relatively low doses is a powerful psychedelic. The doctors did identify the Valium and morphine-like substances in my blood, Demis and Lex, but could not identify the third chemical, probably because it isn't commonly known for abuse and they didn't test for it. This is four years later and I'm after trying Dilaudid, multiple potencies of acid, all the aforementioned drugs plus legal ones like nitrous oxide, morning glory, and ethyl ether extract, and I've even since overcome a full-blown crack addiction lasting months and I've never felt anything more powerful than this drug. This is strictly for people who can handle losing total contact with earthly boundaries and personal identity. This entire experience heightened my awareness of human frailty, and since then, every hallucinogenic trip I've embarked on has been dreadfully frightening, except with mushrooms. I now stick with depressants and weed. I think I'm going to make a concentrated tonic of Datura seeds ending up with the potency of half a teaspoon of seeds per one milliliter of tonic and leave it kicking around the house for curious trip seekers, five bucks for a one milliliter drop. I would never take this drug again, and if you're going to, I would recommend you use the Datura plant material and not the refined medical stuff. Don't overdo it, in fact, underdo it at first. Have two or three of your friends stay sober or just smoke weed and be ready to watch you trip for at least 24 hours. This is an activity that probably takes a whole weekend and don't worry, the trip sitters will have loads of fun with their fucked up friend. For Datura trip sitters, it is wise never to start an argument with the subject. Go with whatever he or she says, i.e. dad had to pretend he was my buddy Tim at one point. If they are engaging in a hazardous activity, distract them from it, then remove it. If they have a knife, don't just try to take it. Tell them the fairy gods will trade a magic potion for it or something. Trust me, they'll most likely buy it. Then give them water. Give them lots of water, as much as they want. People on Datura don't need things like cigarettes, liquor, or weed, because whenever they want it, they just tend to imagine it, and it works. Don't take anything they say to heart, they are not themselves. I.e., I told my stepmom, dad's wife, that I was going to fuck her in the bathroom. And last of all, have fun. Try to keep the entire thing in a peaceful, happy ambiance. In mid-June of 2018, I had just graduated from middle school in May and would spend the summer vacation with a group of friends I used to have. This friend group were very into vaping nicotine which I would do occasionally when I was with them. Being fresh out of middle school, I had gone through an adventurous phase where I would basically try anything put in front of my face for the sheer sake of having tried it. 
On one particular day, I was walking around in the town center a few minutes away from my house with some friends when some girl around my age that I didn't recognize asked us if we'd like to smoke some weed with her. I had a clear schedule for the rest of the day and both of my parents were at work, so I didn't see any reason not to try it out. We walked into a nearby alley next to a deli where the girl pulled out a dab pen with THC and wax form. With my complete lack of knowledge surrounding weed, these terms meant nothing to me and I was just urgent to try it. I had a friend at the time who had tried it, presumably a low to average dose. He had told me that it only makes you feel chill and mellowed out. A couple of my friends took some small puffs while some didn't even inhale. When the pen was passed to me, I thought it would be impressive to my friends to take the biggest hit I possibly could. I would do this on occasion with nicotine to show off the fact that I never cough after inhaling for long periods of time. After about 10 seconds of inhaling, I exhaled and coughed up a storm. For a brief moment, I felt nothing. After about 8 seconds, I felt a tingling sensation in the top of my head accompanied by a severe nausea. I had noticed the girl who owned the pen was looking at me like she had seen a ghost. Her friend had said something to her along the lines of, this dude just fucking killed himself. Hearing this only worsened my concern. I told the group that I had to vomit and ran over to the end of the alleyway behind the building and bent forward to vomit. Nothing was coming out so I sat down behind the building hoping to wait out the nausea. When the nausea was gone, I was ready to stand back up but realized that I felt extremely weak to the point where I couldn't move my legs. My friends noticed me laying down behind the building and ran to my aid. I could hear them talking about how I didn't look so good and how my skin color had gone very pale. Two of my friends picked me up and put my arms around their shoulders to help me walk towards the exit of the alleyway. This is where everything I heard sounded 8-bit like something out of an arcade game. When I had stood up with the help of my friends, my vision had completely gone. What I had experienced was comparable to that of standing up too quickly and everything going black for a few seconds. The only difference is that it wasn't going away. The thought that had raced my mind was that I had gone blind from taking too much THC and had permanently damaged my hearing. Thankfully this was not the case as when my friends sat me back down in front of the deli, my vision had cleared and hearing had returned to normal. I assume in retrospect that these effects were caused by a sudden drop of blood pressure. This would also explain the pale skin tone. After having been sat down, I felt completely paralyzed. This is when the psychoactive effects came in hard. I felt as if all of my thoughts and everything I saw were in slow motion. I was able to talk, but every time I did, I could hear my voice echoing in slow motion inside my head, which quite literally made my thoughts too loud for me to focus on completing any sentence. I basically just went through the process of knowing what I wanted to say, but then being interrupted by the noise of my own mind by the time the words were actually coming out of my mouth. My friends had told me later on that many of the things I said would trail off into nonsense or sometimes even gibberish. My perception was heavily altered. I had felt as if I was just a pair of eyes sitting inside of a movie theater watching everything play out. I saw it as a second consciousness within myself. While I was talking out loud to the people around me saying gibberish, I felt as if I was viewing everything through the lens of my sober consciousness and unable to control anything my body does or what comes out of my mouth. I didn't know how to describe this feeling of watching myself lose control at the time, so I would just chant things like, I'm in here, these aren't my eyes, or this isn't me talking. My friends told me after the fact that I had sounded like I went completely insane. I was also unable to improperly sense where my tongue was in my mouth. I had the overwhelming fear that my tongue had turned into a squid tentacle as when I would move it around in my mouth, my mind would picture it slithering around in unnatural ways. Once I hyper-focused on it, it became terrifying to speak as I believed it could accidentally slip out of my mouth causing me to bite down on it while talking. The town I had lived in was a relatively small town, so I personally knew a lot of people from around the area. People I had gone to school with had been walking or riding their bikes before stopping to observe me. Employees briefly came out of the deli to spectate as well. In my mind, everyone I knew would eventually be here staring at me, which led me to getting extremely paranoid. My sense of time was deeply distorted, leading me to believe that half the day had gone by while the effects continued to stay at a peaking point. 
it was more likely only 15 minutes in at this point. I couldn't understand a word anyone was saying to me. I just continued to ramble on despite all of the questions and suggestions I was receiving from everyone around me. I was very overwhelmed by everything that was happening and found it even more distressing that the effects hadn't subsided even in the slightest. I started to believe that the only way out was to take the inner consciousness out of the shell of me that was losing control. I had told my friends, trust me, I need to hurt myself to make it stop. My friends got worried and debated with each other about calling 911. Luckily, I wouldn't be able to move my legs anytime soon, so I couldn't pull through with my plan to run into the street only five feet in front of me. A couple minutes after that thought had crossed my mind, a small part of me briefly woke up causing me to think, what am I doing? I need help before I hurt myself. I had exclaimed to my friends to call an ambulance. The ambulance showed up in about five minutes. The paramedic in the back asked me about my symptoms, to which I replied with the same description of my eyes not being my own. This statement on its own was enough to lead the paramedic to believe that the wax was laced with something. Tests had revealed that the cartridge wasn't laced, but I had just taken an extreme dose of THC straight to the brain. For about a few days after, I still felt a small bit intoxicated, but to a level I could function at. I have since been diagnosed with a depersonalization disorder. Today I vaporize Delta 8 and HHC, which help me ease anxiety. I am unable to smoke more than around a gram of Delta 9 cannabis without having intense visuals and flashbacks. I know it's virtually impossible to overdose on THC, but if I had to throw the label on it, I would definitely point to an experience like this one. I was 16, young and naive. I was planning on going to an annual music festival that happens every year in my small hometown at a park me and my friends used to frequently drink and drug at, called the Mission Folk Music Festival, a three-day gathering of hippies, musicians, and psychedelic heads. I was definitely two of those three types of people, guess which ones. I guess I'm also a musician as well, having played in several bands since then as a keyboardist. I still swear by and use psychedelics, but in a much more careful and less frequent way than when I was young. Prior to the festival, I called my best friend Ann at the time and told him I'm going to buy 8 grams of mushrooms for us, and that he should eat 4 and I will eat 4, and he agreed. Everything was falling into place, and I was happy, ecstatic even. I loved attending this festival, and it was just a 5 minute drive from my house. On the day of the first day of the festival, I bought the 8 gram baggie on my walk to the park from a friend who was a seller at the time. It was around midday to evening. I had free entry to the festival because I had volunteered for a couple of weeks with the site setup crew. I mostly just helped put up the fences and barricades and a few of the smaller wooden stages. I was so happy that the festival was happening and was looking forward to a lot of the acts. The festival features a lot of world music from a lot of cultures and diverse acts from around the globe and was looking forward to the Indian musicians that were going to play. I thought this would be even better to see while on mushrooms. So I buy the bag, head into the festival, and meet up with my friend S, who had already set up her tent in the camping area where several other friends were already hanging out around a tiny makeshift fire pit, which was mostly just burning paper and sticks in a dugout hole in the ground. There were also a few older guys, probably in their 20s, who were people from neighboring tents. So I sit down on one of the lawn chairs in the circle of people and I felt pretty great, especially to my young immature self at that time. N hadn't arrived yet and me and these people at the circle were passing around a few bottles of liquor and just bantering and having a great time. That's when I got the bright idea that I should start eating my half of the 8 grams of mushrooms right out of the bag, mostly because I thought I would look cool and stand out from the rest of all the people around me. So the liquor kept being passed around and I kept munching on the shrooms without even looking at the baggie, like I was eating chips or something. After 30 or so minutes, I looked down and realized I had eaten probably 7 of the 8 grams of the mushrooms. Not thinking much of it other than it being a morbid turn of fate, I basically said, screw it, and polished off the remaining mushrooms and dumped the powder at the bottom of the bag into my mouth. I thought I was so cool. Things were great for the next little while, N finally showed up and I told him that I was sorry and that I had ate the whole bag, and he was like, what? Are you serious? 
So after a bit, all of our friend group decided to head towards the music. There was an international band playing, can't remember what style or which language, but I remember it sounding beautiful. This is when I started to come up. I joined the crowd of people in front of the main stage, dancing in a fluid way that I can only do on psychedelics, and it was really fun. The sun had set now. I remember starting to get a feeling like vertigo, only it wasn't dizziness. It was the thoughts in my head getting really loud and whispering to me almost. I stopped dancing and left the crowd and I magically bumped into N. I told him I need to get away from the people and was starting to ramble incoherently about how worried I was about something and how I have a bad feeling. We hurried to the far side of the stage and then it really started to hit me. I left my friend and sauntered over to the stage and embraced it like it was a person or a loved one. I was starting to lose my mind at this point. I remember dancing as I flowed back into the crowd with the pulsing rhythmic music controlling me. A few friends periodically appeared in my reality asking if I was okay and I shooed them off. I was really starting to trip at this point. I left the crowd a little later because my thoughts were getting louder and making me dizzy and the hallucinations were beginning. But these weren't ordinary mushroom hallucinations. It was like my eyes couldn't focus and the entire world was constantly spinning. It reminded me of when I was a kid and I used to spin around in circles and then lay down and close my eyes and felt like everything was spinning. I was becoming disoriented and I was stumbling around, all the while beginning to freak out about something. I was truly hysteric. My friends couldn't control me and neither could security, who were just volunteers like myself. I ran faster than I knew I could back to the campsite searching for S's tent. I ended up crashing into and falling and many other tents with people in them on the way. I was lost and freaking out. People were starting to come out and look at me. I remember shouting everything I was saying because it was like it was the only way I could be heard. I was frantic and disoriented. I ran back towards the side of the main stage and proclaimed some ramblings out loud towards the sky with my arms stretched out like I was Jesus or something. Eventually, someone called the cops in an ambulance. Next thing I know, cops appeared in the middle of this festival and everybody was looking at what was going down. I was taken to the ground and three or four cops were standing above me asking what I was doing and what I had taken. I couldn't give a straight answer about anything at this point. All I remember is shouting, what do you want from me, over and over. An ambulance eventually pulled up to the middle of the festival and I was restrained and hoisted up by the cops. This is when I had this odd vision of seeing the planet from outer space and people celebrating all over the world with fireworks going off. When I got into the ambulance, I was tied down by my arms, legs, and chest and we started driving to the hospital. There was a woman in the ambulance who appeared like a green old gremlin and she pulled down my pants and stuck a catheter in me. That was pretty traumatic. Eventually, I get to the hospital and I'm still tied down and restrained as doctors and nurses walk around me. By this point, the dizziness and hallucinations are too much for me to even begin comprehending what's happening. All I know is that I'm scared. Next thing I know, people around me put a mouth gag in me. Later I learned it was because I was shouting and spitting at people. Now, I'm tied down to a hospital bed, unable to move and unable to speak, while peeking on 8 grams of mushrooms. This is when I was so panicked by the reality around me that I remember thinking the only safe place was inside my mind. When I closed my eyes to escape into the recesses of my mind is when the real crazy part of the trip began. I remember blasting off into a tunnel. It was dark, but the tunnel around the darkness was like a glowing blue swirling like clouds. Neon or electric, I guess. Then I started to feel warm and I also felt like I pissed my pants, though I later found out that I didn't, thankfully. This is when I found myself in a void with little window screens like old school tube TVs where I could see different lives, choices, outcomes, or lifetimes I've lived, not sure which. I remember going into one, literally living an entire life from a young kid to an adult and dying, then going back through the neon tunnel into the void, then without any control, going and living a whole other life, over and over again. The funny thing is, throughout every life I lived, my big sister was there throughout all of them. I'm starting to tear up writing this. She's always looked out for me and is basically a second mom to me. It brings me a bit of comfort to know that she's been with me for so long and maybe she'll be there for my next life, if that's even a thing. 
Eventually, I started to come down. I was now just laying in a hospital bed, tied down and gagged, when a nurse came by and ungagged me, seeing that I wasn't freaking out anymore, and I was unbinded soon after. My parents stood over me, and all I hear is the beeping of hospital machines around me. I thought I died at first, but then I thought I'd come back to life, and that this life is the one I'm currently living in the bigger picture, and I was so damn appreciative of it. I sat up with a ton of energy and proclaimed, I'm okay, I'm okay. On the drive home with my parents, I looked out at the moon. It was full and bright, and the stars were like diamonds. Clearly, I was still high, but nowhere near as high as I was a few hours earlier. I was just so thankful to be alive. I love my life today so much, and I'm grateful and feel lucky to have it. Sure, my life has had a ton of ups and downs, but I'd be lying if I said I'm not appreciative and privileged to have it. I learned that night that drugs are not something to be taken lightly, and life is worth the pain. Background Info I'm semi-experienced with hallucinogens, having tried DXM, LSD, psilocybin, and ketamine a few times, plus a plethora of other substances. I've always handled heavy doses such as 5 dried grams of shrooms and 0.5 grams of nasal ketamine, so I was honestly overconfident going into my first Amanita experience. None of the substances I have tried has had any delirium-like qualities, so I should have been much more careful with the dosing. Preparation Amanitas are hugely misunderstood. Most reports and preparation tutorials claim that drying them converts most of the ibotenic acid to muscimol, but a scientific study done about the conversion proves otherwise. Instead of just drying or otherwise heating the mushrooms to 100 degrees Celsius, one should boil them in a liquid with a pH of around 2.5. Lemon juice with a hint of water is what I used, and the results were anything but disappointing. I live in Scandinavia, so amanitas are super common here. I picked seven caps of varying sizes and boiled six of them in the lemon juice plus water combo for around 140 minutes. Then I poured the lemon juice mushroom soup into a cup and let it cool down for an hour. I drank half of the liquid and ate approximately four caps after fasting for 20 hours. For me, it wasn't that disgusting, but most would probably disagree. The lemon juice was the only thing I tasted and the texture of the non-dried caps wasn't that bad either. The experience. After ingestion, I started watching Pan's Labyrinth while waiting for the effects. Around 15 minutes later, I started feeling a bit sedated and the feeling quickly began to intensify. 30 minutes into the movie, I had to stop watching and decided to sleep for a bit because the tiredness was already pretty intense. First, I did a 20 minute nap, but couldn't get myself out of bed and fell asleep again, this time without an alarm clock. Amanitas are incredibly potent dream enhancers and I had a vivid dream with an LSD-like looping of some events that happened before I fell asleep and some made up ones. I woke up an hour later, sweatier than an 80s porn star. The last thing that happened in my dream was me pissing myself, so when I woke up in damp clothes and confused mental state, I was sure I had just wet my bed. The weird thing is, I went to the toilet and after emptying my bladder, I was still sure that the sweat of my bed and clothes was piss. I was panicking because I thought I had to do laundry in the super confused state. After 5 minutes of checking my bed again and again, I realized there was only sweat on it and the accident hadn't really happened. Regardless of my inability to understand what is real, I thought I wasn't noticeably intoxicated, so I drank about half of what was left of the juice and ate one more cap and then decided to head outside, now two hours in. Finding a water bottle, keys, headphones, pipe and clothes and getting myself out of the door took around 15 minutes because the amnesia and confusion were so intense. My plan was to head to the nearest forest and just walk around there. Walking was similar to walking while significantly drunk. I kept wobbling and couldn't keep a straight path, but never fell or were close to falling. Every time I blinked, I could see red and green lights that formed nature-themed surreal imagery. The visuals only lasted through the come-up and faded after around 30 minutes. 
The looping on Amanitas was just insane. It resembles LSD loops where it feels like reality is constantly folding and creating combinations of realities. My mood was pure neutral, nothing really felt like anything. For example, nausea was just a feeling with no negative connotations. The delirium-like qualities of Amanita started getting more and more prominent as the experience went on. For the whole duration of the trip, I felt like I had to do everything the voice in my head suggested me to. Luckily, it was never really anything bad. I always had one mission I had to do in order to elevate my consciousness. These were things like drinking a specific amount of water in a specific place, taking a stick from the ground and moving it to a specific spot. Every time a task was performed successfully, reality folded again and created a better reality, which in fact didn't feel any different from the one before it, but I always thought the next task would work. The first hour of my walk was nothing but doing harmless missions, until the mushroom voice in my head told me to smoke resin that was left in my pipe. Nasty and a horrible idea, but obviously I couldn't say no to creating a better reality, so I smoked. I took two long hits, really long since I couldn't feel any pain, and then started walking again. Now the tasks were finished and reality could fold itself without me doing anything about it, so I just walked around immersed in thought. The immersion at this point was just insane. I would be in my thoughts for 5-15 to 15 minutes and just snap out of it and realize I'd walked the whole time without me knowing it. Sometimes I followed the trail, sometimes just walked in a straight line. Around five minutes after the resin ingestion, I developed two thought streams that I kept switching between and had to find out which of them was reality. In reality, it was neither. In the main thought stream I believed to be true, I experienced every person's acts that led up to totally random events such as a car crash or a window breaking or a house burning. I felt like I was God who had to manually create events by acting out every person's role in said events. And not just people, but I had to act out the role of inanimate objects too. Acting out a single event felt like it took weeks, months, and at the end of the trip, years. In my other thought stream, I didn't need to be every person, but rather follow one person that led me to look at the same events that I had created in my other thought stream. The person was myself viewed in third person and all the events, the car crash, the house burning, happened to that person. In other words, I created my own death from start to finish several times and then watched it happen. As I was walking back to my house, I remember several instances where my nervous system would shut off for a fraction of a second and my legs would fail me. Luckily, the fraction was so small that I never fell down, but constantly doing strange ducking motions and wobbling was really annoying. It kind of felt like an electric shock that would reset my physical body. The walk shouldn't even be called a walk, since it felt like just teleporting. For example, I didn't remember even a single frame of the last 500 meters of the journey. As I got to my door, I got this thought in my head that I didn't have keys, while in reality I did. At this point, the drunkenness was at new heights, and I smashed against the wall for dozens of times in a period of a few minutes. I was in a total psychosis, thinking the iterations of my death world was the real world and I couldn't stay in the actual physical realm even for a second. Thinking I didn't have keys and having left a window open, I decided to break into my own apartment and after several minutes of trying, I finally succeeded. Now inside, I realized I hadn't touched my keys during the walk so they couldn't have been missing so I started looking for them. After 15 minutes of looking, mostly comprised of trying to find out what is real and what isn't and trying not to fall down every 10 seconds, I found them. Now it was time to finally go to sleep. Aftermath and Thoughts When I woke up, I saw that I had apparently thrown my stuff and my roommate's stuff around the kitchen, but luckily nothing was broken and the chaos was manageable. The big problem was my phone missing. I did a Hail Mary move and went to look for my phone in the forest after a rain and actually found it and it was still working. I had a really hazy memory of me throwing my phone into the ground and it being screened down in the ground suggested that that was exactly what happened. I am not planning to trip on Amanitas a second time since it wasn't pleasant and the fact that I could have done anything during the periods I don't remember scares me. 
The trip did bring some insights, but it's just not worth the risks. Ironically, my worst drug experience ever came from something perfectly legal that nearly everyone takes for granted. I work in a coffee shop and though I don't usually drink coffee at all, I guess I was so used to being around it that the caffeine had ceased to seem like a drug at all to me. So one weekend, a good friend and I, being all out of pot, which has always been pretty benevolent in all my experiences, were bored and looking for a buzz. We found this in a box of Vivarin caffeine tablets. Two bored teenagers on the weekend, we decided to start small with just a couple pills, hoping it would add an amusing glow to our boredom. Wrong move. It all started when I called him up to see if he wanted to drive into Hollywood and look for something to do. I went to go pick him up after downing two of the pills from a 16 pill box of 200 milligram caffeine tablets. Driving to his place, I felt a sort of optimism about the day ahead, most likely just the placebo effect. When I got to his house, he took two as well and we drove to Hollywood, which is about 10 minutes from his house. I think at this point, I also had two more as it had been a good hour since I took mine and I wasn't feeling anything. He drove around aimlessly for probably about a couple of hours. I think we were looking for somewhere to shop for clothes, but we were just bored and restless. Somewhere in that time, I remember my friend taking a couple more, and an hour later, he said he was feeling a pretty strong buzz. I wasn't, so I figured the pills were weak or I had some weird tolerance, so I took five of the pills and my friend finished the remaining three. We eventually ended up at Jet Rag, a store I like to buy clothes at, and while we were walking around there, the buzz hit me really hard. I felt slightly tingly and very amped up and also slightly agitated, but it was a positive feeling. I started to get a little lightheaded and my thoughts were racing, so I figured I was peeking out with the pretty disappointing buzz. My heart was beating pretty fast and I felt kind of uneasy, so I decided we should get some food to help us absorb it. We got in my car and as I was pulling into the street, I almost hit someone and felt extremely jittery. My friend asked me if I was okay and I said I was fine, thinking I was just overly excited. We ended up at Cafe 101 which was nearby. I had to urinate very badly so we went to the bathroom and as I was urinating my legs started tingling as if they were falling asleep and I began to shake a good deal. Right now as I am reliving this experience I am actually feeling kind of uneasy and nervous. This was nothing compared to the night I was about to endure. We went to a table and ordered a couple sodas while we browsed the menu. I confided in my friend that I felt really weird and that it wasn't a good thing and that I needed to eat. Suddenly, as I sat there, I felt vomit surge up, but I was fortunate enough to suppress it and didn't puke all over the table. I ran to the bathroom and hurled yellow, the color of the tablets. I stayed in the bathroom for about 30 minutes hyperventilating, sweating, and feeling very sick and throwing up a couple more times. Finally, I regained some sense of composure and went outside to find my friend with two other friends of ours who we had planned on meeting. They said they felt bad for me and I needed to eat. Shortly after I sat down, I had to pay another visit to the bathroom. I could tell things had gone too far, but I figured I was getting rid of the excess caffeine and I would be fine after not too long. I think I was in the bathroom for another 30 minutes. I then told my friends I would go wait in the car. I was feeling a little better and actually started to drift off to sleep when they knocked on my window and suggested we go chill by the pool of some hotel. I asked that we wait so another 30 minutes transpired and at that point I felt okay enough to go over to the hotel which was only 5 minutes away. During the drive I started to feel like I was going to vomit again and got very shaky and uncomfortable. So I parked and waited in my car for a couple hours while they went to the hotel pool. I rolled back my seat and drank some water, but I threw up out of my car door several times while I was waiting for them. I didn't even care that a lot of people were watching me do it. I had never felt so sick in my life except maybe when I had a bad flu. I called my friends and told them I had to go and I also called my girlfriend. She said I could go to her house since her parents weren't home and someone needed to be with me in case anything really bad happened. 
At this point, I was getting pretty scared. I barely made it to her house, which was 30 minutes from where I was parked, and traffic made it even worse. I had to pull over and vomit very painfully on the side of the street twice on my way there. I finally arrived and apologized to her right when I got there for fucking up and being stupid. I called my parents too who don't mind that I smoke pot and are pretty open minded so I didn't feel that bad telling them. They were at a park and basically said, you're stupid but call us if you need to go to the hospital. This was just a month after my 18th birthday. I had to stay at my girlfriend's house in the guest room overnight because I was violently ill and could not drive. Her dad told me that he did the same thing when he was my age and he felt my pain, but he only ate two pills. I had nine. I threw up all night long. I sweated bullets and had awful diarrhea. I had to vomit every hour for a while and then it got to every 20 minutes. I wasn't sure what was going to happen to me, but I had hoped that I would be okay by morning. I tried eating toast, water, and juice, and I couldn't hold down any of them. I remember laying with my head on that dirty bathroom tile, sweating uncontrollably, feeling like I was going to die, and being in more excruciating pain than I had ever been in. I was dry heaving almost constantly until 10 in the morning, and I finally had my parents come to get me to take me to the hospital where they pumped charcoal and fluids into my body via an IV in my wrist. I was just so happy to be alive and being taken care of by someone who knew what they were doing. I have never been in so much pain in all my life, and since caffeine is a stimulant, I was painfully aware of every moment from that night. I felt so horrible for doing it because of worrying my girlfriend and my parents so much, and for doing something so dumb. It took me a couple days to fully recover from being up for so long and vomiting so intensely. My abdomen and throat were sore as all hell and I felt so completely exhausted. By some miraculous stroke, I did not have work the morning I had to go to the emergency room, even though I always do, so I didn't have to call in sick or anything. But I learned a hard fucking lesson and had the worst experience of my life from something people put in their bodies every day. I will never eat caffeine pills again and I will definitely not be so reckless with putting shit like that in my body anymore. Oh, and the real kicker is, my insurance almost didn't pay for the $1,300 hospital visit. We weren't sure why, but we thought it was because it was self-inflicted. Luckily, they ended up paying, but that in itself was an equally big scare. If you're gonna do drugs, make sure you have good medical insurance, just in case. <laughs>